What's up folks? This is Raf Bari, Brown University physics graduate student. Welcome to Advanced Statistical Mechanics. Today we're going to look at how to extract the classical equations of motion from the Hamiltonian for a physical system. And then we're going to look at how to use the canonical probability distribution and the partition function z to derive the equation for the observable for a physical system. So let's dive right in. Hello folks, this is Raf Bari, Brown University physics graduate student. Today is our first lecture in statistical mechanics, one of the most important branches of physics which explains the macroscopic properties of everyday physical systems. So here's my box with n particles and with a volume v. Now each of these n particles has two things that completely characterize their behavior, their momenta, p sub i, and their coordinates, q sub i. So let me write that down. Each one of these particles has a coordinate q sub i and a momentum, p sub i. Now, here is the claim. First of all, we know from Newton's equations that the force acting on each of these particles can be written as the time derivative of the momenta or the negative gradient of the potential acting on these particles. Now, there's another way we can express these two basic facts using the Hamiltonian instead of the force. So how do we use the Hamiltonian to express this? Well, Let's say that we have a Hamiltonian, very basic Hamiltonian, one that consists of the kinetic energy, p sub i squared over 2m, plus the potential energy of the system. How do we extract the position and momenta from this Hamiltonian? Let me write q sub i here. Well, we just have to take different partial derivatives here. First of all, if I take the partial derivative, partial h, partial p sub i, then I'm going to get the time derivative of the coordinates, q sub i. How does that work? Well, it's very simple to prove this. First of all, if I take the derivative of this Hamiltonian, then I get p sub i over 2m is equal to q sub i dot. This, uh, this gives me p sub i is equal to m q sub i dot. And that makes sense because what is momentum if not simply the mass times the coordinate, uh, coordinates temporal derivative for that particle. Okay, so this is our first equation that we have to take note of, that the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to momenta gives us the time derivative of the coordinates, q sub i. And then the second equation that we're going to be mindful of is as follows. If I now switch up the momentum and coordinates, I get partial h partial q sub i is minus p sub i dot. Now, how does this make sense? Well, this one is also pretty straightforward to prove. First of all, moving the minus sign to the other side and taking the derivative of this Hamiltonian, we get minus partial v partial q sub i is equal to p sub i dot. But of course, p sub i dot, well, what is that if not force, right? And what is minus partial v partial q sub i if not the negative gradient of the potential? So you can see that we have reproduced our two well-known equations of classical mechanics, that force is the negative gradient of potential, and that momenta is simply the mass times the temporal derivative of the coordinate from the Hamiltonian. So now we are reproducing classical mechanics from these two basic equations involving the Hamiltonian. Now we're going to step it up a little bit further. Now let's say we want to focus on a specific observable for a given physical system. What is an observable, you might ask? An observable is any physically identifiable property of a physical system. For example, the average energy, the average volume, the average number of particles, the average pressure, these are all observables for a given physical system. The simplest physical system we might have is particles in a box. So let me draw that out. Let's say we have a box and we've got some particles in said box, each with its own kinetic energy and potential energy. Now for this box, if we wait for this box to reach thermal equilibrium with its surroundings, then this box will have presumably the same temperature as its surroundings. At that point, we can figure out what the equilibrium energy, equilibrium pressure, equilibrium volume, and if we allow chemical potential to exist, the equilibrium number of particles in the system is. So these are all examples of physical observables, things that depend on the system reaching thermal equilibrium. Now, what do we do if we want to figure out um, what a given physical observable A is equal to? How do we define that physical observable? Well, as I said, we have to wait for the system to reach thermal equilibrium. So we 
let the system approach thermal equilibrium by waiting for a long time and then we simply take the integral as regular. We find the value of the, of the observable which is a function of the positions q sub i evaluated at some time t prime and the momenta p sub i evaluated at some time t prime and integrate this with respect to time. And this is the general equation that tells us how to figure out the value for a given observable at any given time. Of course, once the system has reached thermal equilibrium, the whole point is that the observable's value will stay fixed in time. It's not going to fluctuate. Now, there's another way that we can define the value of an observable, and that's by using weighted averages. Okay, We can write that this is simply equal to the value of the, observ uh, the, value of the observable at some given time, Okay, which is a function of the coordinates q sub i, and the momenta p sub i multiplied by the equilibrium probability distribution which is also a function of our initial conditions and then we integrate with respect to our coordinates and momenta okay so this is another way to understand what the value for an observable is after the system has reached thermal equilibrium now although it might seem a little bit circular we can say that at some given point in time the value the instantaneous value for an observable, not its average value, its instantaneous value, which is given by A, evaluated at some time t, where A is a function of the coordinates and position. Now, the coordinates and momentum, at some point in the future, the value for our observable is simply going to equal the average value for the observable plus some correction factor, which is dependent on the number of particles. So what does that mean? This means as the number of particles increases, as n approaches infinity, we have a well-defined value for, for our observable at any given point in time. If n approaches infinity, then the value for the observable at any given point in time is simply equal to its average value. And we know how to compute the average value for our observable. We can either use weighted probability averages or we can evaluate it as follows by waiting for the system to come to thermal equilibrium. We also have a normalization condition for our probability here, our equilibrium probability distribution here. And that normalization condition is very simple. It just says that if we integrate our equilibrium probability distribution, is a function of the coordinates and momenta, then this should equal 1. Now we actually know even more. We know what this equilibrium probability distribution is from elementary statistical mechanics, which tells us that the equilibrium probability distribution as a function of the coordinates and momenta is simply equal to the Boltzmann distribution, e to the minus b times the Hamiltonian. Okay. So if you've never seen this before, that's okay. Oh, by the way, I have to weight it with the normalization constant, which is the partition function z. So if you've never seen this, this before, that's okay. This is simply the Boltzmann distribution. It tells us that as we increase the temperature of our system, the system is less and less likely to be in that particular state. In other words, the system is most likely to be in its ground state. Okay, that's what the probability distribution, the Boltzmann distribution essentially says. Now, one more thing, this z, this partition function, is actually extremely important, okay? So what is this partition function? It's essentially a normalization factor, but in reality, it's much more than that. So this partition function, z, let me write it over here, z is equal to the sum of all the possible Boltzmann distributions, so e to the minus b h, which is a function of momenta and coordinates, dq dp. This is what the Boltzmann uh, partition function is equal to. All right, folks, so that's it for the first lecture of statistical mechanics. In this lecture, we figured out how to extract the position and momenta, the general equations of classical mechanics from the Hamiltonian, and then we looked at how to figure out the values for an observable A, starting with the Boltzmann distribution, where the partition function is simply your good old integral of the Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta h, where h is the Hamiltonian, which is simply the total energy of the system, kinetic plus potential. Keep in mind that this beta right here is usually written as 1 over kt. Some textbooks might classify it as just kt, but that is what we covered in this first lecture, and we'll see you
tomorrow.